I appreciate you giving me a couple of minutes. And so what, I'm, what I've been asked to talk about a little bit is, is how consumers are thinking differently about food generally and about beef specifically. So I'm not going to say everything that I think are important trends. I'm going to cover a, th a few things that I think are, are worth talking about and, and, and to consider how people are thinking differently about food. At the end, I'm going to share a little bit of stuff that's specific to animal welfare, but it's not so much that I want to talk to you about animal welfare, but to talk to you about kind of where agriculture is at right now in the minds of consumers. Because I think we are kind of at a crossroads right now, and we have an immense opportunity as food uh, producers uh, to position ourselves for long-term success. So the first point I want to make is the consumer no longer exists. How many people have heard someone talk about the consumer, right? It's the consumer is doing this, the consumer is doing that. There is no the consumer. The problem is everyone's doing something different. And really, that shouldn't surprise us. Because as consumers here, we don't all do the same things. I walked in today, and they're not just all Ford trucks. There's all sorts of different kinds of trucks out there, right? We all behave differently. We all like different things, and we need to think about food consumers as different. They are thinking differently. They're individuals, and we can't try and give them all the same message. And that's not just related to product. It's related to where that product comes from, and it's related to the message that we deliver to those individuals in how we communicate what we're offering. People want different things in food. We really, in North America, went probably, I was going to say 50 years ago, but maybe that's not long enough, probably 60 years ago, 70 years ago, at the end of the Second World War, people came back. We really changed what we expected out of food. We wanted quick, cheap, convenient, consistent. Food was and is, to a large degree still, a commodity. Right? And we talk about commodities. We've seen differentiation in lots of other products. It's really interesting that we haven't seen it in food. Although we're starting to see it in food. I haven't been at a grocery store here in, in Swift Current or in Regina or anywhere in probably five or six years. But I went the other day and took a class to a grocery store in Guelph, where I live. When I was a kid, there were two types of eggs at the back of the grocery store. There was large and extra large. And you wanted that, you got to choose. I went to a grocery store in a student section of the, uni at the in, in Guelph. There were 16 different choices in the egg fridge. 16 different choices. And it ranged in price from 275 ish a dozen to, I think, a high of about seven bucks a dozen. And people were paying seven bucks a dozen. The, the grocery retailers wouldn't allocate that space, frankly, if it didn't generate a return. So we're not all buying the same things. And there's some pretty clever stuff. You know, they used to run eggs over a light table, and the double yolks had to get broken and put in to the processing eggs, right? The bulk liquid eggs. You know, you can buy double yolk eggs at a premium now because the bakers like them. So what was a byproduct before is now roughly twice as much a dozen as regular eggs. And so people are thinking about, how am I going to use this product? What do I want? And, and, and where am I going to buy it? And again, there's a bunch of different characteristics. Nutrition. Production. How it's produced. We've heard organic. All, you know, we, we've heard all sorts of different things that can and maybe should go into the production process. Where it's produced. In this room, lots of us like to stand up and say, buy Canadian beef. My wife will not buy any beef that's not Canadian. She will go search out a manager in the grocery store 
and say, it doesn't say where this is from, can you tell me? And if they can't, she won't buy it. Now, many of you in this room would say, well, that's because Canadian beef is better. Frankly, I'm pretty sure if I put a couple of different steaks in front of her, one from the US and one from here, I'm not sure every time she'd be able to tell the difference. But it matters to her as a consumer. And those sorts of differences will matter more and more. We are no longer producing beef. Frankly, I think we are producing specific kinds of beef, or at least we will be. And there's other characteristics. We heard this morning about welfare. Uh, sometimes the size of the producer makes a difference. Uh, sustainable production, we heard from Matt earlier. Other elements, all of those sorts of things are going to start differentiating products. And we're going to be building these value chains or these supply systems that allow us to reflect those differences. Food companies recognize this and they treat customers differently. You know, there really are only two or three big grocery chains in this country. They just have several different kinds of stores within those chains to deal with different kinds of customers. They offer the same products, or at least variations of those products, to different kinds of customers, depending on what that customer wants. Processors get the difference. And really, in the end, the question becomes, who extracts that value? You know, this restaurant wants smaller steaks, that restaurant wants bigger steaks. If we're buying commodity beef, who gets the, who, who, extracts that value, then it happens up there. What I think is going to happen, and Matt and I were talking about it earlier, is really these devel the development of partnerships. As we get away from commodity beef, we will develop these partnerships that get built throughout the value chain from the start so that we can say we know, not just for traceability, traceability is great and it's important, but in order for us to be able to tell the story that's associated with this product, in order to provide the narrative that's associated with this product. An important point in this is that the larger your share is, the tougher this is to do. We want everyone to eat beef, right? We'd like it if everyone ate beef. And to a large degree, except for five or ten percent, most do. Keeping ninety or ninety-five percent of the population happy is harder to do than if you have a twenty percent market share. Anyone guess what Tim Horton's market share is in the coffee business in Canada? Anyone have a guess? It's about eighty percent. Eighty percent of the coffee bought in this country outside the home is bought at a Tim Hortons outlet. That is a much harder position to be in than if you're A&W and you're a small share of the big quick service, quick service market and you can do things that are specific and individual. Tim Hortons has to try and keep everybody happy. That's why they're thinking about all of these things even if it's only a very small segment of their total market because if they lose that segment, their share goes down. So, so I would argue that, that beef is like Tim Hortons, and it's gonna be harder for us to do in the long term. The other thing is, it's hard to predict what consumers are going to want. It's hard to predict what's going to be a fad. It's hard to predict what's going to have staying power. Now we have some ideas and we have some ways of going to ask consumers, but consumers can be fickle. Consumers can learn new things. 30 years ago, no one asked where my runners were made. Then a story came out about kids in Southeast Asia making runners at $2 a day, and all of a sudden it starts mattering to some customers. And it still matters. And that, you know, we heard about the tragedy in Bangladesh last year, and now people are asking where my clothes are made. So some of these things become emerging issues that are hard to predict. Some of these things are trendy. 
right? What's hot on the food network? What's the hot vegetable? Someone told me that the hot vegetable for 2015 is going to be carrots. I was, you know, it's, it's, you know it's, been an, it's been an ignored root vegetable for years, but a couple of chefs got together, and all of a sudden you can get carrots in a, in a restaurant where you never would have seen it before. Where you never would have seen it before. What are the things that are going to affect beef? I can't tell you for sure. I expect health, but is it going to be more fat, less fat? I'm not sure. Is it going to, I, I expect animal welfare will be an increasingly important one to people. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more in a little while. So it's tough to pick the winners. It's tough to pick what's going to last and what isn't. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Because if we don't change, frankly, consumers will go look for what they think they want somewhere else. The other thing, and I think that this merits a little bit of attention, and frankly, I'm not 100% sure yet what it means for, for beef, is people are shopping differently than they did before. Grocery stores, uh, we, we have evolved to these large suburban grocery stores where we tend to go once a week, fill our minivans or our pickup trucks, go home, and that's it. People are buying food in lower quantities more frequently. Why did Loblaws buy Shoppers Drug Mart? Loblaws bought Shoppers Drug Mart not because they wanted to get into the pharmacy business, because they wanted small local stores that they could increase the grocery footprint in. Walkable stores that people can go get food for a day or two days that doesn't happen. That's changing. It likely means the end of the big super pack of ground beef that people bought cooked for the week. Well, it doesn't mean the end of it. It just means it'll be less popular. People will buy for the next day or two. That's really what happens already in Europe. Energy prices are much higher. Fridges are much smaller, living spaces are smaller, fridges are smaller. Most Europeans will buy food a day or two at a time, whereas in, whereas in North America, we're buying a week or two at a time. We're also seeing people shop in more different places. If you look five or ten years ago, people got groceries in one place. That's where they shopped. Now if you look, most people will buy or shop five or six different places in a week. They will have the place that gives them the item that they want. And, and that, again, becomes important to say grocery stores are looking to make sure they have as much of this. In, in grocery stores, the whole strategy is to, to increase your share of wallet, right? We try and get people into the grocery store and we try and get them to buy as much as we can. And so what we try and offer is as many different choices as we can. 16 different types of eggs. 30 years ago, you would go into a grocery store and you would see five different brands of the exact same kind of mustard. Right? There was some sort of processed mustard. There might be a little bit of gray poupon off on the side, Dijon. Now you go to a grocery store and there's only one kind of prepared mustard because there are 17 or 18 or 20 different other kinds. Trying to offer what that individual wants. We haven't seen that as much in the less processed products, but we are starting to see it. 16 different kinds of eggs. We're seeing it a little bit more in pork. And I think we will start to see it before long in beef as well. Demand for meat is changing, and I'm using demand in a little bit different context. I'm not talking about, I, I'm talking about how much people are eating and, and, and what they're choosing, because it's interesting. What's interesting is people are eating less meat, beef, but they're willing to pay more for the beef that they're buying. That's why we're seeing that graph that we saw earlier. But we'd like to understand a little bit why people are eating less. And, and it's confounded a little bit by these record high prices, right? It's hard to sort of tease out what is a trend and what is a reaction to the prices we're seeing right now. People are eating less meat, less red meat. We've seen this trend, I think, 
what did you say? It was a 30-year decline in average consumption. That's happening. I think it's also important to say, understand, you know, we hear about these vegetarians there and the vegans. You know, trust me, on campus I see a lot of them. But they're not driving what's happening in beef. I think what we're seeing a lot here is people saying, I'm either going to eat smaller portions or maybe one day a week we won't eat a meat protein. We'll eat something else. We are, at my house, about to become empty nesters. And my wife said, oh, it'll be amazing in the fall. Maybe one meal a week we'll have without meat. <laughs> I nodded obediently, as I should, and just planned to go to a restaurant for my meat that lunch, whatever day that was going to be when I was in at work. So, but that's happening. We're getting older as a society. We're eating smaller quantities. We're more conscious of health. We're getting all sorts of bombarded with messages from all over the place about how much red meat we should or shouldn't eat. Uh, and, and, and that's driving that. Smaller portions are driving it for sure as well. People are just eating less as they sit down. Product mix changes as well. Some people are eating less meat overall and then are eating better cuts. So that's why we see that demand factor, right? I'm willing to pay more because I don't get to eat it as much. So when I eat it, I want it to be amazing. Some people are saying, I'm getting stuck with that. I'm getting stuck uh, with a limited budget. So I'm going to eat more, I'm going to eat just as much beef, but I'm going to buy some more of those bigger, uh, of those lower cost cuts which is why we see that ground beef effect that, that we heard about earlier, right? People are saying, I still want to eat beef, so uh, the demand for ground beef goes up and that, and that happens as well. The next point I'm going to make, as far as a consumer trend, is that restaurants matter more. In Canada, we spend 35 to 40 percent of our food dollar outside of the home. 35 to 40 percent of our food dollar is spent outside the home. And we don't, we don't pay a lot of attention as to what's happening in restaurants, particularly in the academic environment. In the U.S. this year, that number will cross 50 percent. More than half of the food dollar in the U.S. will be spent on food consumed outside of the home. I was in uh, New York yesterday morning, I think, but Saturday during the day. And in Manhattan, I bet you that number is closer to 80 or 90 percent. People just do not prepare and eat food at home. And that's important. It's important for a couple of reasons. Restaurants have the ability to, to shape demand a little bit. Grocery stores can give choice. So grocery stores, Grocery stores, sorry, will say, well, I'll give you the option of buying this or this, and I'll let you make the choice. Restaurants don't want to manage that many SKUs. So restaurants say, we will do what we think our customers want, and we will do it with all of our, pr our purchasing power. So they have the ability to change things pretty quickly. The other thing that's worth noticing is that people make decisions differently in restaurants than they do in grocery stores. And as they're making more and more of those decisions in restaurants, it's important that we understand those. It's important to say, okay, people are buying a plate or they're buying a meal. Now, to a large degree, that meal is driven by the protein that's on that plate but they, will, they, they are making decisions differently than if they're buying a prepackaged steak or a package of round beef or some seasoned pork chops. And we need to think about what information we need to get to those consumers as they think about it differently. The other thing is that consumers will take more risk in a restaurant than they will in a grocery store. People are more likely to buy organic 
in a restaurant than they are in a grocery store. Why is that? Because they only have to make that investment once. It will enhance that experience while they're at the restaurant and they can feel good about it, but they don't have to be consistent. They don't have to spend that money in the grocery store every week. Same thing with other attributes. The flip side of that, though, is it gives them the ability to experiment. And so people are making decisions a bit differently. So, given that restaurants matter more, what, are, what's, what do we see happening in restaurants? First thing is, margins are being squeezed in restaurants. Lots of capacity. There are tons of restaurants in this country and in the US. There's tons of capacity. They're not as busy as they'd like to be. Food cost is going up. We heard Ann talk about what beef, 18% year over year, was that the number? 18% year over year. Low margin business, food costs are going through the roof. I need to find other ways to get margin. So what's happening in restaurants? If the news is good, it just means portion size is getting smaller. I talked to the Canadian vice president of a restaurant company a couple of weeks ago and they are talking to their beef supplier about getting smaller steaks. They just can't hit the price point that they need to hit with what they're doing now. So the margins are getting squeezed. The other thing that's happening, we've heard the drive to increase minimum wage. Someone gave a shot to the uh, Alberta government the other just earlier. Sanford, uh, Seattle has already raised the minimum wage in Seattle to $15. Uh, Los Angeles has made a long-term commitment to doing that. The city of New York is talking about doing it. Uh, we've seen one increase in Ontario. There are more to come. That will hit restaurants. And the attention, to a large degree, has been on quick service restaurants. So a value meal is going to go up. It will hit full service restaurants even harder because they have more labor, right? If you're having someone walk it out to your table, this increase in labor costs is going to, again, make them make choices about what they offer. The other thing that's important to remember about restaurants is that they work hard at being different. Even these large chains work hard at differentiating themselves so that they can offer something that's different than the other ones are offering. And so we're seeing way more variety in restaurants than we'd ever seen before. And, and even in quick service, look at quick service restaurants. I think it was Harvey's in Canada that came out with the first Angus burger, is that? I think so. Then all of a sudden, within a few years, everyone had an Angus burger. When was the last time you heard an ad for an Angus burger at a quick service restaurant? It doesn't differentiate them anymore, so they don't want to pay a premium for the beef if they're not going to get a premium out or, or increased share out of the marketplace. a and it's always a bad name to bring up in a beef crowd, I understand that. What did they do? They made a solid strategic choice. They didn't do that randomly. They found a supply, frankly, I, and, and this is just what I think. I haven't spoken to them. I, I hope to get a chance to speak to them at some point, but I think they found a supply that was gonna be hard for someone else to source quickly and said, here are a whole bunch of attributes in this beef. Let's go do a whole bunch of market research, which we know they did. What's gonna resonate most with consumers? They didn't create that market they just exploited that market and created some value, but they did it in a way that was hard to replicate, and that's all they were trying to do. They were trying to block others from imitating them so that they could, they could grab a chunk of the quick service restaurant market. And you know what happened? Their share of the market went up 10%. It worked really, really well. At the upper end of the restaurant market, we're seeing people offer a whole bunch of different things. And again, this is driven to a large degree by the Food Network, right? 
30 years ago, the only choice when you went out to a fine dining restaurant was how would you like your steak done? Saturday, I was in two upscale restaurants in, in Manhattan. Neither one of them had beef on the menu. Not because those chefs don't like beef, but because they were looking to differentiate themselves from other players in the marketplace. So what was on the menu? There was duck on the menu and, and all sorts of different weird stuff I'd never heard of before. And in fact, dinner on Saturday night, we sat down, looked at the menu, and my friend looked up at me and said, do we need to leave? And I said, why? He goes, you were looking forward to beef. I'd been talking about it all day, and he'd looked at the menu, there was none on the menu. And because my wife is a very particular person and I've had to walk out of restaurants before, I was not interested in walking out of this one in New York, so I had dinner without beef on Saturday night. They're looking to differentiate themselves. And we can say, hey, that's no big deal. Fine dining is a pretty small sector, section of the market, and that's true, but again, People experience different things, they try different things, and people sort of emulate what that experience is. So I think we need to think more about what restaurants are doing, how they're doing it, and how we influence how those restaurants make choices. The next point I'd like to talk about is what I call the citizen-consumer divide. And, and I, I've been talking about this for a while, and then a few weeks ago, someone sort of highlighted to me that this is, this is really what it is. That people think differently about what we should do than they often act as they, when they are consumers. And so that, to a large degree, is driving things like sustainability, is driving things like animal welfare, because people, even though they're saying, well, I'm not making those decisions in the grocery store, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why that's happening in a minute, but they are saying we should be doing something. And I think what the, what the take home here is, for industries is, that if we aren't active in this discussion, if we aren't active in making some of this progress, consumers will be asking someone else to make it for them. So I think that there's a real opportunity here for us to create value for consumers. Stop seeing it as a threat and see it really as an opportunity to create value for consumers. Because I think, and I get ahead of myself a little bit, a big part of why consumers aren't buying what they say we should be buying is because they have no idea what they're getting. So it's, you know, and, and my, my background is as an agricultural economist, and, and uh, you will see my very last slide has a graph on it, because an economist isn't allowed to make a presentation without a graph in it. And if they come audit, you will all certify that I did show you a graph once I show it to you. We do willingness to pay stuff all the time, right? And you've heard, you've had economists stand up in front of you and say, look, the willingness to pay for this attribute is this. Right, you've seen that. And then we put it into the store and no one buys it. Why? Well, part of it is some bias in how we do the research because people will always tell us that they'll do what they think we want them to do or they will do what they think is the good thing to do, and then when they're in the privacy of the grocery store and throwing stuff into their cart, they're hoping no one looks, then they act differently. But I think what one thing that we've missed in that discussion is that consumers also have no idea what's happening. They have no idea what they're getting, they have no idea what's in the, in the package. And so they think we should be doing this, and they think maybe to a large degree they are. And that's what I mean when I say a lack of action may not be a lack of commitment, but rather a lack of awareness. And that's an important distinction. I think that's what I'm going to talk about for my remaining sort of 10 or 15 minutes. 
We did a bunch of work supported by Tim Hortons looking at animal welfare. Tim Hortons was one of the companies that made commitments on eggs and pork. We're now starting to do a little bit of this work in conjunction with the University of Alberta on beef as well. But uh, we wanted to look at consumer stuff, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about. But we also wanted to look at how we would make some of these changes in the context of the value chain. So what could we do to do this? And punchline is, with eggs, it's pretty easy to do, right? You make the change in the barn, put the egg in a container, and away you go. It's easy to keep it separate. Well, if Tim Hortons is buying some breakfast sausage and a little bit of bacon, what the heck do I do with the rest of that carcass? Right? So we, we have some different challenges in, in, in these markets, but let's just talk a little bit about consumers. Consumers are thinking about animal welfare. 60% expressed concern of five or higher on a, on a scale of one to seven. Less than 20% were at the bottom of the, many were sort of unsure. Yeah, I think it's important. I'm not really sure what's going on. In hindsight, we should have asked this a little bit differently. Because we don't know if the people who aren't concerned just don't care, which is, which is a possibility, or if they're not concerned because, hey, I think we're doing a pretty good job. And for the most part, Consumers think we're doing a pretty good job. Consumers trust us. Consumers think we're doing a good job of producing food for them. That's a great position to be in. But there's a yeah but. Can do consumers trust us? Yeah but. They have no idea what, they're do what we're doing. They have no idea how food is produced. And I may be getting ahead of myself. We asked them, we ask consumers some basic questions about agricultural production. We ask a beef question. We ask the question they got right most was that a dairy cow had to have a calf before she gave milk. And only 30% of people knew that. And that was the question that was answered correctly the most. We asked people what they were buying in a store. The most common answer was, huh? I don't know. So, it doesn't tell us whether, what they are thinking about, but they are sort of aware of it. In the retail, consumers tell us that animal welfare ranks in the second tier. So you still have to have a good price. Still need to be fresh, still need to be safe, all of those that taste good, all of those things are table stakes. If you don't have those, you're not in the game. The second tier included animal welfare, nutrition. Those are the things that differentiated. Those are the things that people are going to leverage as a difference. What's interested in meat, environment, brand, organic, we're in, the second we're in the third tier, ranked below. So with the consumers, those, with that group of consumers, there was animal welfare, actually, I hate to tell you this, but animal welfare actually rated higher than fair treatment of producers. <laughs> now, again, I don't think that means they're saying, well, stiff it, we'll give it to them. I think they're thinking right now that producers are getting treated pretty fairly. I won't get into that debate. We won't, we won't argue that one today, but they think the producers are being treated pretty fairly and they're saying, who's watching out for the animals? In a restaurant, we, what we did this time, we gave them 100 points and we said, what influences your decision in a restaurant? What influences where you go by? And animal welfare ranked 2.2 out of 100. So the temptation is, in this circumstance, to say, it doesn't matter, move on, right? But it's much higher for a segment of the market, which is a higher proportion of young people. Young people are going to be customers longer than older people are. It's basic biology. And they are thinking about it. 
So what we need, and this gets back to what I said before, there is no the consumer. Let's take a look at how these people broke down. First group was the unconcerned group. We're not worried about animal welfare. Again, I have to admit we made a bit of a mistake here. We don't know if they're not worried about it because we think they, they think we're doing a good job or I just don't care. That's an important distinction. We should have got it, we didn't. We're in the field again right now, we'll, we'll, we'll get it clear. They don't believe their personal food choices make a difference. So they're just saying drive on is essentially what this group is. This group represents about 22% of the sample, much more likely to be male. They're not particularly price sensitive. They're just looking for other stuff. Again, there's a danger in assuming that they don't care about animal welfare. They don't have a good, they, they really have no idea. The, the, I was going to say this group is clueless, but the truth is, to a large degree, they're all clueless. The price sensitive group. These are people who self-identified as price sensitive. That doesn't mean other groups aren't price sensitive because we saw price rated at the top, but these are the people who said it's really all about price for me. All about price. What's interesting, from a restaurant perspective, the people who said they're all about price are less likely to eat out, which makes sense because it's more expensive to eat out, more likely to eat at home. They're not concerned or aware of animal welfare. They just want whatever's cheap. How big a proportion of the group do you think that is? It's about another quarter. The biggest group, about half, is what we identified as the concerned group. These people say labels should indicate more clearly the rearing conditions of animals. We can't label everything. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd have so many labels on a package, we'd never ever be able to see the beef inside of it anymore. What I think this, and I don't think these people are necessarily saying we think it should be labeled. What they're saying is, we'd like to know more, and that strikes me as a way I could know more. 40% said it would influence their retailer choice, 39% said it would influence their retailer choice. So they're thinking about it, and it matters to them. It's in their consciousness. They're about half of the respondents. They tend to be younger. They're much more likely to be female. More likely to believe that their choices can make a difference, so they become activist consumers. More likely to say government should play a role, and that becomes Again, a reason for industry to be a little more proactive. And they are slightly more inclined to a scientific argument, but not that strongly. How many times have we said, hit them with science, right? If the consumer asks us a question, hit them with science. It doesn't necessarily just matter about science. If a consumer is not happy with it, the science doesn't matter. I had, a, I had a pig vet tell me that the best way to euthanize a piglet is to grab it by the tail and whack it quickly on the concrete. It's quick, it's painless, it's clean. Scientifically, makes a ton of sense. It's as good as many of our other options. So I'd like volunteers, put up your hand if you're willing to go stand in a grocery store and look consumers like my wife in the eye and say, the science says that if I whack that piglet good and hard on the floor, on the concrete, it's great. We should drive on. Science can tell us what we can do. It can't tell us what we should do. And we need to be aware of that distinction. Right, I talked about all the different trucks I saw out in the parking lot here as I came in. And, and again, I had another 
producer at a, at a meeting that I spoke at once sort of jump up and say, Mike, all we got to do is convince them of the science. And I looked him in the eye and I said, what color is the equipment on your farm? And he proudly stood up, sorry, your guys in the back, said, it's all green. And I said, show me the science that says that every piece of equipment, that that's the best in every circumstance. What kind of pickup truck do you buy? If we expect to be able to make choices based on preferences and emotion, we have to respect the fact that consumers may be buying our product on the exact same set of metrics. They identify as less price sensitive. Price seems to be the factor. And this is great news. Half of consumers say, if you give us the stuff we're looking for, we'll be less price sensitive. Hallelujah. This is great news. Then when Ann comes here in five years again, that graph is going to be even higher. These are ways that we can add value to our product so that we become less susceptible to that price substitution. The last point I want to make about this group, and I'm running, I think I'm okay for time, is I hear all the time, yeah, Mike, those people who are talking about animal welfare, they're only the people who want to kill agriculture anyway. They think we shouldn't be eating any meat at all, right? It's the vegans and those people. We're never going to convert them. Let's ignore them. Well, A, this group is 50%, so they're bigger than the vegetarian vegan crowd, and they eat at least as much pork, beef, eggs as the other people in our sample. And in fact, it was slightly higher. So these are consumers of our products. If I remember, we actually might have explicitly excluded vegetarians. I don't remember. I know from one of the surveys. I don't know if we did from this one. But they, this group are our customer. Unfortunately, they have no idea. I talked about they don't know if they're getting antibiotic-free pork. They don't know if they're getting crate-free pork. 80% said more space improves pig animal welfare. That's probably a lucky guess, right? All of us would like more space. We ask the same people, do gestation stalls improve pig welfare? Sounds good. Yes. There's overlap there. These are people saying both sides of this story. They've got no idea. They're trying to answer. I don't know if I have this slide in. Half of consumers said castrating baby pigs is positive. Half said castrating baby pigs is negative. Now, I've never looked at the gender split on those responses. But again, it says they have no idea when we ask them about welfare. So what we have is consumers who think we're doing a good job, but they have no idea what we're doing. That, to me, has a little bit of risk associated with it. That, to me, says, what if they don't like what we're doing and we fall off? And, and let me give you an example. I was at a conference last week. I was talking to a woman from, uh, from Britain. And as we, I'm not sure if it was last year or the year before, they had their horse meat scandal. Right? Where some grocery stores had prepared products that were supposed to have beef in them, and it wasn't all beef. There was a little bit of horse meat in there as well. That didn't just hurt those retailers. That hurt consumers' trust in the system. We've always thought it was good. So that, to me, highlights the need for us to get into a conversation with consumers to close that gap. A student once said to me, and I don't remember what it was associated with, but I thought it was excellent. I don't know if she stole it from somewhere else, but I, I always attribute it to her. She said to me, a conversation can't be two monologues. Right? We have to be willing to hear both sides. 
We have to be willing to state our position, but we also have to be able to hear what the other side is. And in a conversation, if we're sharing what we do, I'm confident that consumers are gonna be happy with 95% of what we do. But we have to be willing to take a risk that they say that 5% I'm not so sure about. I've forgotten where I am. Oh, the act of concern. I'm going to go back here for one second because I always say that and invariably someone stands up at the end and says, Mike, you're right. And we'd be happy to do it if they pay us for it. And I say, that's great, but there's always a yeah, but. What if they think they already are? That's the risk we run right now. So we have to be willing to have that conversation. I think in most cases they're going to be really happy. I think in fact probably the beef business is probably the best shape from an animal welfare perspective of any of the big protein suppliers. I think, I think we are. So I think we need to get into that conversation. But we have to be willing to say, if they say we don't like that, Either be willing to change, or someone else will. Because we know, we talked about markets, someone will provide what consumers are looking for. So, I, I'm going to just go through this relatively quick. Half of the concerned group is what we call the active concerned, and they're saying they're doing, making choices based on animal welfare today. So if you're Tim Hortons, and 25% of consumers are saying, we are making choices on animal welfare today, that is material to your business. Any, any business that aspires to have a significant share is gonna be worried about that proportion of consumers. They're not more aware of production, they are more food aware, I would say. And this is a growing segment of the population. I think it's the last point I'm going to try and make. They're paying more attention to the food they're eating. They're reading labels more. They're cooking more. And the great news is they are less price sensitive. So they're willing to pay us for the attributes that they're looking for. So our challenge is to find out what those attributes are and deliver them. And in many cases, we probably already are. I think I've already talked about that. Over-evaluate over their level of understanding. This awareness gap has the potential to cause the issues. We've got emotional responses. What did the layer people do when battery cages started getting all sorts of criticism? They started to research, right? And what did they come up with? Enriched cages. What's the problem with an enriched cage? It allows a bird to flap its wings. It allows the bird to exhibit nesting behaviors. It allows a bird to have the space to dust bath. All of the things that we want birds to be able to do, but all consumers hear is, it's still in a cage. A huge strategic error, driven by science. Crate versus stall. A sow is in a gestation crate versus a gestation stall. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment that we can use weasel words to get out of the trouble, right? But what I'm saying is we need to think about how we communicate. That matters. And who says it matters a lot. I have a student who just did a survey at the University of Waterloo of 300 university students, millennials, right? 19 to 23 year olds. You know what they told them? He's a, he's a farm kid, and, and he, his whole thing was, I want to get to know, I want 
we had to really sort of rein him in so he didn't have a survey that was really very biased because he really wanted to find out what do they know and how can I convince them that we're good people. And these students said, we'd love to hear from farmers. We'd love to hear. My last slide, I promise. This is not my work, but here's my graph. There's two of them. So if I get audited, please verify. My, my economics degree will continue. This is pork. This is work done out of Purdue in the US. This top graph, if you look at the graph at the top, asks people's perception of, animal, of, of certain farm practices, whether it's good for an animal or not. And you clearly can't read it, but it doesn't matter. Because what I want you to do is look at each one of those graphs. And what you have is a big purple line in the middle, which is, I have no idea if it's good or bad. And then you look at both sides, you have half of the remaining people saying it's bad and half of the remaining people saying it's good. You have the big group in the middle saying, I've got no clue, and then people on both sides saying, I'm guessing. Which says that the American consumer is very much the same as the Canadian consumer. And the last thing is, we th then they ask them, and we've done this too, we just haven't got the data together yet, where would you get information on animal welfare today? That big green thing, the Pac-Man, is I have no idea. <laughs> I hate this one. This yellow one right there is university scientists. So maybe I'm not as secure as I think I am. This brown one here, National Pork Producers Council. The green one right next to it, National Cattlemen's Beef Association, the NCBA, 1% each. The Humane Society of the US is the big blue one, and the next biggest one is PETA. What I think this argues is that we need to be active in this discussion. We have a good story to tell. Consumers are looking to get engaged in a conversation. And if they don't get the information from us, they'll find a place to get it. That relates not just to animal welfare. It relates to hormone use. It relates to sustainable practices. It relates to manure management. It relates to all of those things. We need to be active in that discussion. That, to me, I think, is probably the most important consumer trend that we're seeing today. Thank you very much for your time. That's my email address. If you ever have questions, I'm happy to. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to respond and happy to hear from you. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, we got time for some questions. Uh, while some of you are running to the mic, I will mention that uh, Mike's presentation was brought to you by Growing Forward 2's Agricultural Awareness, Awareness Initiative Program. So thank you very much to them. Question. Uh, yes, very interesting presentation. I could have done without your graph at the end, though, because that just proves the, the relevance or lack of relevance of the beef organizations. But anyway, uh, um, in your study, was it asked if it mattered to them what country the product came from? Uh, we, we, we did look at that at the restaurant choice level. Okay. And uh, for pork, it didn't make a difference. But for beef, it did. For beef, we're just doing that beef research okay. now. So I'm happy to follow up with you. Yeah, I'd my be expectation, <laughs> frankly, my expectation is for beef, it'll make more of a difference because beef has done more to talk about it. Okay. There's just been more of that conversation. It's just really hard. To, no one's ever talked about Canadian pork a whole bunch. The pork organizations have done work to increase the demand for pork, but they haven't done a whole lot about buy Canadian. And in the grocery stores, it's, it's really hard to tell. And in fact, I bet you the grocery stores couldn't tell you where it's from because it, there's such a free supply. Whereas it's been much more important and it's been used and it's been talked about. So my guess is that it will make much more difference. But I'll know in about four or six weeks. Yeah, so the reason I'm curious is because, and, and Ryder could talk about this a lot better than I can, but of course every country's got a different um, uh, humane treatment of animals. Some countries no humane treatment of animals for 
you know, for, so for these people to be concerned about that and, and then not know where their product comes from, you're right, they don't know anything. It, you know, and it, it's interesting, and I didn't have time to talk about it from a, and I, I won't take a long answer here, but, but, but one of the things that I think is important that we look at is we have a pretty good system here in Canada. The, the codes of practice formation process is actually, it's not perfect, but it has worked reasonably well, and we have lots of stakeholders at the table, and, and, that, and that's worked pretty well. One of the problems we have is exactly what you referred to, is if we come up with codes of practice that, that put a different burden on producers here versus somewhere else, we have issues. It's, it's less of an issue with, with the supply managed products because there's no trade. But, but in products that we trade, we have to do that. And, and what I would argue is people get angry at these retail and food service organizations that say, we're going to make a commitment only to buy this stuff. And to me, what I call, I call those codes of purchase. To me, codes of purchase are a much more effective way than we can deliver it and we can still export if we want. And, and we know that our, because the, the objective is to get the consumers the stuff. And so it, it needs to be maybe some combination of the two because particularly with, it's a huge issue for pork. It would, it would be as well for beef. I do appreciate you not spending a lot of time on A&W. And I'll just tell you a quick reason why. I don't know if anybody else has a sore point on A&W as I do, but my daughter brought home a boyfriend here one day and uh, has called, introduced me to him as Bud. I found out after supper that he says, well, I hope, I'd rather you call me Alan. And I said, well, I thought your name was Bud. Well, he says, my name is Alan William. They call me A.W. and your daughter told me that wouldn't go over big here. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to follow up on that. <laughs> Where are you going with that now? I had, I had an idea. I, I lost it. Uh, in terms of code of practice, uh, I know a lot of organic producers have some of the same sort of squabbles, right? Where if 80% of the food, organic food that is sold in stores in Canada is actually from Brazil and China, yeah. there's different levels of, obviously, of production practice. They have the same sort of grape. Yeah. So, Anyone here? I told you, you're not allowed to answer. Who is the largest retailer of organic food in the world? Walmart, right? Not what we would think. Not the sort of traditional sort of perception of, of Walmart. So, and Walmart's strategy on organics is to supply, obviously, to supply organic food to the market, uh, but at the same price as conventional food. So, can you kind of comment on that in well, terms of like, is that the end game for organic producers too? Or? It's going to change the organic market. It's going to change how organic is produced. But what's going to happen is we're going to have different kinds of organic. For some consumers, organic means more than just the production practice. Organic is about who produced it, and Walmart's not going to be able to do that. So essentially, we're going to have this generic word organic, and we're going to have multiple different types or criteria by which people are going to be shopping for organic. Some people would argue that you simply cannot buy organic at Walmart because it goes counter to what organic means. And so we will see, we will end up seeing large scale farms producing organically, but we will still see a large market that, that is the people who want to buy sort of the, the whole experience. The, 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 the last point I was going to make that I remembered now is uh, you talked about the organizations being ineffective. I'm not entirely sure I buy into that. I think we need to, to change the way we communicate. I think, I think that there is a role for a strong voice to say, here's what we're doing and to, and to lead that conversation. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? I was just interested to know if there's been any work done on the correlation between the increase in the immigration, the people that we have coming in here in the country, to the changes in food trends. We are starting to do that work. I don't know that we know the answer yet. Um, I'll give you my opinion. Uh, I think uh, the answer is it depends. I, I think the immigration has changed the variety of food that, that we're seeing in grocery stores. You know, I am a first-generation Canadian. My parents came from Germany 
in, in the 50s. And I remember uh, growing up in rural Manitoba, going into Winnipeg with my parents and often with a friend, right? A trip to, a, a trip to the city was always a big deal. And, and him teasing me about my parents shopping in the ethnic food section which was a small place where you could probably get liverwurst and cheese. And now you go into a grocery store and the ethnic food section is much more diverse. So I think that's been driv driving it. Um, in terms of awareness of welfare and things like that, uh, my guess is probably not because to a significant degree, uh, about half of our uh, about half of our immigrants come from food insecure countries, so they're just happy to have access. They're, they're paying, they're, they're sort of probably in that price sensitive group. European immigrants are probably bringing some of those sort of perceptions and standards from Europe, and that's maybe sort of fanning the, the flames of animal welfare. So I don't think we can make a blanket statement. But I think that's the reason why you've got the two diverse groups on both sides of that purple line, right? Because you can, you, you can assume like, more than likely assume that that group on the right hand side that really didn't know or didn't care were from that, that I, I, I don't th I don't think you can make that argument you know it, it is amazing to me I teach at Guelph and Guelph is an ag school right and and I teach a food course to first year students from from all different colleges and it's just a it's it's an issues in food course and it amazes me uh, how little these young people know. And it's not, uh, it, it has nothing to do with where they come from. It has everything to do that their families have lived in the city for generations and generations and generations. They, they really have, and th they have no idea. And, and so you see two sides of that line. I'm not sure that that's, anything related to where they come from. I think there are kids in Toronto, I think you'd be surprised at the number of kids in Regina, and frankly, the number of kids right here in Swift Current that have no idea where their food comes from. At, at, at the same time, though, a lot of these immigrants, they, they're not coming off of farms, they're coming off of large centers as well. Yep, that's true. They're, they're often, well, you know, when I lived in Lethbridge, all the immigrants were coming from Dutch farms to Picture Butte, but <laughs> and getting into different food. But I, I see what you're saying, but I'm not sure they're any different than the kids who live, I'll tell you, do I have time for one more short story? Roll with it. Yeah. I have a friend who's a dairy farmer just outside of uh, Woodstock, Ontario. And he's big on sharing and having people come to his farm. And Woods, he had, he had, a, nur he had a, a nursery school class from St. Mary's, which is a small rural, ag community come and visit his dairy farm and his kid was in that nursery school class and they oh they had a great you know they saw the parlor and they saw these cows eating TMR and just you know in a freestall barn they were gobbling it up and they saw some newborn calves and they got to feed them with the bottle everything was good like it was the, the, the trip was going perfectly right at the end one of the guys who worked on the farm was loading a cull cow onto a trailer off to the side. And one of the kids says, oh, where's that cow going? And the kid who is living on the farm goes, oh, yeah, she's going to be hamburger, right? She was completely that. The, the whole tour went to pieces. These are kids from an ag community. You mean we, that's where beef comes from? Or that's, well, not beef, okay. But we do it to ourselves. I, last week I spoke to a group of dairy vets and they said, why the heck do people think that all these dairy cows are frolicking through the meadow happily when it's just not the case? And I said, it's because that's what we communicate to them. What do the yogurt commercials on TV have? Have you ever seen a, have you ever seen a free stall or a tie stall barn on a dairy commercial? Cheese? No. They're outside. It's the... We've done it to ourselves. You know, it drives me nuts. You watch CBC News and they'll have a picture, they'll have a story about beef prices or a story about something in the beef industry and it'll be a Holstein cow. And they'll have a dairy story and it'll be a big Charlet bull. And, and 
Right? No one knows. No one, I, I just shake my head, but there's nothing I can do about it. So I, I hear what you're saying. We should probably look at it in more detail, but I, my, my strong feeling is it's not making a difference. I, I, I don't think the kids born and raised here are any more informed.